Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Grzegorz Eckert. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for European Studies, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Minda de Gunsburg uh, Center for European Studies. Uh, now, this is the fifth edition of the summit uh, on the future of Europe. And as you see, we are trying to do anything to distract your attention from tomorrow's elections. Um, um, now, the, the summit was designed as a conversation about future of Europe. Uh, uh, after the crisis in 2008, we were uh, uh, hoping for a very robust recovery and uh, move forward in Europe. But it seems that we are moving from crisis to crisis. Uh, Brexit, uh, immigration crisis, continuous problems with uh, economic performance, and now the authoritarian turn in some new members of the, of the European Union. So we have plenty to discuss and plenty to worry about. Uh, now, the event like this uh, is a very difficult uh, uh, event to pull together. Uh, so let me thank uh, Elaine Papoulias, our executive director, and the entire staff of the Center for European Studies for their tremendous work uh, on bringing you all uh, here uh, uh, today. Also, I would like to thank uh, our partners and sponsors. Uh, so this year we partner with the project on Europe and transatlantic relations at the Belfast Center. Uh, so thank you, uh, Professor Burns, for uh, joining uh, forces uh, with us. Uh, we are also very grateful to uh, Athen based uh, think tank, uh, Diane Ozis. Uh, they have been sponsoring uh, our uh, uh, summit for the second time. And other partners uh, who include the Real Collegio Complutense at Harvard, Central, Univer uh, uh, Central European University, still in Budapest, uh, the European Stability Initiative, uh, and the John Kennedy Memorial Fellowship and Jean Monnet at Personam Chair in the European Union Law. Uh, and government. Uh, so uh, let me uh, invite uh, Professor Burns for uh, just to say uh, some introductory uh, things to you before we start with our first panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to the Center for European Studies, to you and to Elaine. Uh, for convening us here. I kind of feel like we're in a Shakespearean theater. This is a beautiful place to meet. Um, I'm going to be on the next panel, so I'm not going to say too much now, except um, welcome to Harvard. For those of you who come from Europe and elsewhere, welcome to the People's Republic of Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> I say that because we are proudly a deep blue bubble here. Not always representative of each 50 states, but I think um, an interesting place for you to watch this very important election tomorrow. Tomorrow is the first assessment that we're going to get from the American people about Trump at midpoint in, in his, his uh, term in office, his first term in office. Who knows? He may have a second term. Um, and I think the backdrop to this conference is that he has, in my view, stood American foreign policy on its head. Um, we have had a remarkably consistent policy, especially towards Europe, but also globally since the late 1940s. Nearly every Republican and every Democratic president has believed in four things. One, we believe that our alliances are the power differential between the US and Russia and the US and China, our alliances obviously in NATO and our strategic partnership with the EU, and certainly with our six priority defense partners and treaty allies in East Asia. Trump has turned that on his head. He's devalued the alliances. In fact, in, in the European sphere, He's actually described the allies as foes and competitors of the United States. That's number one. Number two is backdrop. He has dismantled what we had built together for 70 years and that had lifted a lot of boats, and that's the multilateral trade system in North America, across the Atlantic Ocean, in East Asia. Now, the jury's out. Maybe the Trump bilateral system will prove to be sturdier and more prosperous. I doubt it. Uh, but that's a substantial second change. A third substantial change is on immigration and refugees, where the United States is now not closing its doors, but partially closing them. A significant reduction in refugees from 70,000 to maybe 19,000 refugees uh, 
at a time when there are 65 million refugees worldwide. So we're not doing our bit to help uh, the rest of the world. And an immigration, a backsliding by the United States. And the fourth pillar is the most important. It's the reason why we have NATO and a US-EU relationship, but that we believe in common values, democracy, human freedom, the rule of law. And our president is on the opposite side of the barricades from Theresa May, Emmanuel Macron, and Angela Merkel. Those are four substantial changes. Uh, and I think that they provide the backdrop for what this panel is going to talk about and what the conference is about. And I'd say one thing about the American people. Look at the Chicago Council poll that our friend Evo Dalder shepherded that came out in September. And look at the um, Republicans and Democrats speaking in that poll about what they believe. They support NATO by historically high margins. They support our relationship with Europe, which is our largest trade partner, largest investor, and largest number of allies in the world. They support trade. Uh, in fact, remarkably, Democrats now have become the party of championing of free trade, which was never the case in the past. Uh, and by narrower margins, but still majority margins, Americans support legal immigration and refugee acceptance. So be patient with us. I think what this panel is probably going to confirm is that we are at a fundamental turning point in the US relationship with Europe. It's a bad time. Uh, be patient with us. Uh, because the American people in the polls don't agree with these substantial changes on these four pillars. Last point I want to say is just thank Center for European Studies for bringing us together. This, this couldn't be better timed uh, as a conference. We're kind of the little brother to the Center for European Studies. This is the main part of Harvard focused on Europe. At the Kennedy School, uh, we don't have a single professor tenured uh, teaching European politics. And so we're trying very hard to create a professorship um, in European studies because you cannot be uh, the kind of school we want to be without that focus on Europe. And last year, with a lot of help and assistance from our compatriots here, we established at the Kennedy School a new program on Europe and the transatlantic relationship that Carl Kaiser and myself, Catherine Kluver, um, have set up. And um, we're very pleased that Fidel Sendagorta, Fidel, you are here, uh, is with us as our fellow. He's an uh, ambassador from Spain on active duty. Uh, the Spanish government was nice enough to send Fidel here. And so he's a living bridge between the US and uh, between Europe and the Kennedy School. And we also have inaugurated a new conference in Madrid, in Segovia, which we had in July, which we'll have again um, uh, in June of 2019 as a way to bridge the divide as well. And so we're doing our part, we hope, um, to raise the consciousness of Europe at Harvard University. Thank you very much. For coming. I am honored to be leading a panel with uh, this amount of expertise, both left and right. You really could not do better. I think uh, it's a sign uh, that you've all recognized that, that you're here at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning on a college campus. That is very impressive that an event starting at 9 a.m. on a college campus is already standing room only. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to talk about the transatlantic freeze on this panel, as you know. Uh, we have here, of course, you've just heard from Nick Burns, the Roy and Barbara Goodman Family Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy at the Kennedy School, also beloved by the students there, a fabulous teacher and a fabulous colleague. And he spent, uh, as you can see in his bio, 27 years in US government service, serving, among other things, as a US ambassador to NATO. And on a personal note, I'm very grateful to Nick. I'm currently working on a history of post-Cold War NATO enlargement, and Nick has been very helpful to me up to and including this morning where he deciphered his handwriting on a document he hadn't seen in 25 years. <laughs> so he is a, 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 a diplomat, a scholar, and a gentleman. And then we have uh, Karen Donfried and Daniela Schwarzer. Karen Donfried, I had the pleasure to know when I was working at the German Marshall Fund, which is thriving under her masterful leadership. Uh, Karen came to the German Marshall Fund after having served as special assistant to the president and senior director for European affairs on the National Security Council at the White House. She has some amazing photos of herself with President Obama, if you're ever lucky enough to visit her beautiful office. <laughs> I, I strongly recommend doing so. And uh, 
I have not yet gotten to know, but I'm looking forward to getting to know Daniela Schwarzer, who used to work with Karen Donfried at the German Marshall Fund before she was headhunted away to be the director of the Dege Ape. Uh, I, I believe you're the first woman in that role, is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the first woman to lead the Dege Ape. And uh, she also has extensive experience with the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, is a well-known commentator. Her name is frequently in the New York Times, the Financial Times, and all other journals of, of note. So as you can see, we really have an amazing amount of expertise here. And I will ask each of the panelists to talk for about 15 minutes on the topic of the transatlantic freeze. I will warn you, I'm going to be fairly strict on time because with the amount of expertise, not only on the panel, but also in the audience, I want to make sure that we have time for a good discussion. So they'll each talk for about 15 minutes. And then I might just ask the first question, but then I will go to the audience for questions and we will have until 10.30 for our discussion. So should we, actually I just realized we haven't talked about the order in which we're going to start. Do you, everyone's pointing at you, Nick. So you've just been nominated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you alphabetically come first. It's your, your lot in life. So thank you very much. Thank you. How's this? How's that? That's better. Okay. Um, Marilise, thank you very much. Um, I would start with this thought. I think we're facing the most significant divide across the Atlantic, at least since Suez, but in a structural sense since the 1940s. Uh, because of, for the reasons that I explained in my opening remarks, President Trump has changed, in, changed entirely the construct of how Americans should look at Europe. We're divided by climate, climate change. American people support the science behind climate change, but the president doesn't. We're divided by the fact that the U.S. left the Iran deal and secondary sanctions are being imposed starting this morning, which I think is a grave mistake. We're invited, in, we are divided by our trade differences. And we're divided by how Trump, President Trump sees the world. He's ambivalent at best about NATO, ambivalent at best. He's made his peace with NATO, but you don't see American strategic thought leadership at NATO the way you have, I think, with every administration going back to Harry Truman. It's so bad, in fact. He uses NATO as a punching bag that on April 4th, 2019, which is the 70th anniversary of the signing of the Washington Treaty, there will be no head of government summit. And there will be no gov head of government summit because the other leaders and the president's own staff aren't sure what he would say or whether he'd use the 70th anniversary as a way to criticize the European allies and his new punching bag, uh, our great friend, Justin Trudeau. And so, um, ambivalent at best, that's me being extremely diplomatic and overly uh, an easy grader. You could say he's the weakest president we've ever had concerning NATO, and that's absolutely the case. Um, we're divided by his stance towards the EU. He believes the EU is a strategic competitor. He says it over and over and over again. Europe's a competitor. Europe's been unfair to us. Europe takes advantage of us. The EU is a foe, the word he used. You read Steve Erlanger's great columns from Europe over and over again. That's how he sees you. If you are a European, you are a competitor. And no other American president since before FDR has believed that Europe is a competitor, because it's not. He's extremely weak on Europe. Forgive these superlatives. Um, but they're not exaggerations. He's the weakest American president we've had on Europe since before World War II. By, by any definition uh, that you care, any metric that you care to apply. He is disinterested in helping Europe on the, in the Balkans, and a lot of us now very concerned about both Bosnia-Herzegovina and the Serbia-Kosovo relationship. These are issues where Europe should lead, but there's no question that, Europe, that the United States and Canada should be helping Europe on these structural problems of what happens to the Bal Balkans at a time of Russian mischief and Chinese investment, which is making the Balkans a very complicated place these days. Most importantly, and I refer to this in my opening remarks, if the United States and Europe have ever stood for anything, it's our common faith of democracy. And for a while I felt in the president's first year, maybe he's just indifferent to prioritizing democracy. He's a realist, I guess. 
He's a transactionalist slash realist. And so he uh, is most interested in deals. That's his background. And that's how he f calls what he does as president. And you know, he was silent the first six to eight months of his presidency on human freedom, democracy, the rule of law, the kind of things that Ronald Reagan would have led a speech with, silent. But I think it's worse than that. I was in six European countries between June and August of this year. And in nearly every capital I went to, my European friends would say to me, Steve Bannon was here last week, yeah. Yeah. Uh, organizing um, a new extreme right coalition for the European parliamentary elections in the spring of 2019, actively trying to undermine Angela Merkel and Theresa May. And then the president's extraordinary attack on Merkel in July. Um, and that he's been very consistent in trying to undermine her politically. And then the extraordinary affirmation of Boris Johnson in the press conference when the president stood beside Boris Johnson's greatest rival, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. So now I conclude that the president actually is supporting the anti-democratic right. The effusive praise of Viktor Orban after Orban's election and immediate call from Donald Trump. The effusive, nonstop praise of the polls. Look at the President's UNGA speech, UN General Assembly speech in September. The polls. He took a shot at Germany in that same speech, a formal speech before the United Nations. He chooses to undermine Merkel and her government. So we have a President openly siding with the anti-democratic right in Europe. Openly siding. That's not true of Pompeo. It's not true of Mattis. It's almost as if we have two governments in the United States. So this is a major problem. And as you know, I think it contra it's contradicted by the public opinion polls. And I'll just give you one anecdote. I testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in September, two months ago, this week, on NATO and Russia. And that's a Republican-led committee. They have the majority. Bob Corker was in the chair. And I, exp I, I went saying that we ought to support, obviously, uh, NATO, we ought to be fully fledged leaders of NATO, and we ought to be sanctioning and containing the Russians. I expected and a lot of criticism in my testimony of Donald Trump. I expected a big Republican pushback. Didn't get it. Every Republican senator, with the exception of Rand Paul, who's along with Bernie Sanders, the real isolationist in the American Senate, every Republican senator supported the criticism of Donald Trump openly on the record and joined in on the criticism. The Republicans are with the president on taxes. They're with him on this domestic agenda. At least the Republican senator's not with him on the degradation of NATO, not with him on the weakness of Russia. It's still in Republican eyes. That's still something they want to protect. And I, I, I thought that was a very important experience for me to see the divisions in the Republican Party. Having said all that, now you know where I stand on Donald Trump. Where might Trump be right? And how might Europe reflect that there are things that Europe can do to help maintain this relationship until the American people cast their final verdict on Donald Trump in November 2020? Number one, Trump's right on defense spending. It's interesting to go around the United States. I mean, we do. Uh, travel across the country, speak in small towns or big cities. The point that's really resonated with Americans is Europe's not paying its fair share in defense, and they're right. Trump has, he, ha he has figured out that this, is, this violates a sense of fair play, particularly on the part of Germany, major economy, spending, Stefan, I don't know, 1.2, 1.3% of his GDP. Spain, Italy, the Netherlands, all around the same level. Canada at 09 and you remember Bob Gates's farewell speech to NATO in 2011 saying future presidents and future American publics won't support this. And I do think, no matter what you think of Donald Trump, if the alliance is to move forward, Europe needs to do more. Um, should we have a broader definition of what constitutes defense spending? Sure. 2% is somewhat artificial. Um, but it's got to mean, but that broader definition has to be meaningful. It has to be contributions to the military strength of NATO. Can't just be ODA towards distant countries half a world away. It has to be meaningful. 
And I do think that the President has a lot of Democratic support here. I don't see any significant Democrats differing with the President that Europe has, and especially Germany, have not done enough. Now, the good news here is that since 2014, four years running, there have been real, there's real growth, real, in defense spending of NATO countries um, uh, be, since the invasion of Crimea and the annexation of Crimea by Putin through to 2018. Um, it's true that nearly every country will be at 20% funding of R&D research and new technologies. 20% of your defense budget will be spent on our military R&D and new, new technologies. That's positive. Three quarters of the allies will be at 2% of GDP spending by 2024. Germany won't be there. And so I think Donald Trump is right on that. The second area where I think I would just suggest for this conversation Europe ought to be reflective is, um, and Karen and I were together at a conference at the Center for a New American Security on Friday with a lot of young American experts on NATO and some Europeans. This idea of strategic autonomy. I'm not sure I understand what it means. How can Europe be strategically autonomous if it is incapable of projecting military power outside of Europe and struggles even to project it inside of Europe? And frankly, whatever people mean by that, in English, that word autonomy connotes separation. Mm -hmm. I just ask you to give us two years. Be patient with us. <laughs> I'm betting that we return to our senses and return to a transatlantic policy that looks very much like what we've had the last 70 years. Strategic responsibility would be a much more artful way to describe what Europe should do. Of course, Europe should be responsible for on its own. And I'm someone who supports PESCO, who believes that Europe should be doing more as the EU, because I support the EU. But to an American, American ear, strategic autonomy looks like we're leaving you. It's either a separation or it's a divorce. And that's not going to work with your friends uh, in Congress, in both parties, or with uh, people like me. Last point, with an eye on the clock. Um, what are our future challenges together? We've got to figure out Afghanistan. There's a big move in the Trump administration. I think the president's right about this. 17 years in, stalemate. We just lost a great leader on Saturday. The mayor of um, North Ogden, Utah, um, is a reservist. He's the mayor. He took a year out to do reserve duty in Afghanistan. He was killed. Um, uh, he was killed by an Afghan soldier on Saturday. Uh, we've lost uh, 2,500 American soldiers killed, many more wounded. The Europeans and Canadians have lost over 1,000 soldiers. Uh, we've done our best. I think the President has been right to appoint uh, Ambassador Zalmay Halizad as our envoy. He's right to be talking to the Taliban. We just can't leave, but we've got to do this together because we went in together um, I remember August, two, August 8th, 2003, we deployed 8,000 European troops into NATO to join the American troops, Canadian troops. Europeans have played major roles in Helmand, Oriskan, the Canadians in Kandahar. It's been a supreme effort. We've got to think through how we end a major troop deployment in Afghanistan. And just two more ideas. Over the longer term, for the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to be fighting the battle of technology. We may be, technologists say, we may be looking at the greatest change in military technology in the next two decades as we've had in the last six or seven decades. If you think of our platform systems that define military power, F-35, ballistic missiles, carrier battle groups, they all could be made obsolete by the changes coming in the digital economy, particularly as artificial intelligence is and it will be weaponized robotics, quantum computing, the ability, if you succeed, to break any code. You can break into the nuclear codes. You can break into the vault of German intelligence, French intelligence, or the CIA. The battle of technology is largely being waged by the West against Ch West, Western scientists and Chinese scientists. The Chinese wish to become, and Xi Jinping's clear about this, the dominant power in the Indo-Pacific. They think the technological leap will get them there. 
um, we are looking at a competition that we have to win, or at least stay on par, or else we become the second, we in the West, greatest military power in the world for the first time in eight decades. Can't lose the battle of technology. It's being fought at Caltech, MIT, University of Texas, the German universities, the British universities, the French universities. And we've got to coalesce. And our tech companies have to work with our governments. That's happening in China, not happening in the United States. And if we wage the battle of technology, we've got to also wage the battle of ideas. You Europeans are doing it as you confront alternative for Deutschland. Marine Le Pen, Geert Wilders, Viktor Orban, Salvini, and the Polish government. We're with you. We're with the small d democratic governments of Germany and France and Britain. We're with the opposition in Poland and Hungary. That's where the Americans are, except for our president. And so that battle of ideas to keep Europe and North America democratic, we're battling it here. If you look at our campaign, the lies, the racial divisions, the usurpation, usurpation of authority, we have anti-democratic populists inside the United States government. And so waging these two battles together is another reason why NATO and the US and EU need to stick together. Please be patient with we Americans. <laughs> Thank you, Nick, in yet another sign. Oops. And yet another sign that you are the consummate professional. You spoke for exactly 15 minutes. <laughs> Let's see if Karen can do the. <laughs> Over to you, Karen, to do the same. Great. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks to the Center for European Studies for putting this on. It's wonderful to be on a panel with three friends. And I think the reason we all pointed to Nick Burns to go first <laughs> is because he's such a model to all of us for the amazing contribution you've made, not to a transatlantic freeze, but to strong transatlantic cooperation over the course of your career. And it's great to see the Kennedy School working with the Center for European Studies in that spirit. So the title of the panel is Transatlantic Freeze. And I thought I would divide my remarks into three parts, sort of why do we have that title? I mean, what's happening in the US? And Nick spoke very eloquently to that. What's happening in Europe? And then given that the Europeans in particular don't like what's happening in the US, is there anything Europe can do about it? And so I wanted to start by saying that I think what's singular about this moment is that the freeze is not because of particular policies. You mentioned Suez, we could mention the Iraq war, we could mention various periods when US administrations have pursued policies that European governments fundamentally disagreed with. I think the issue today is so much more significant because it's about the underlying order. What is the kind of world we wanna live in? And the lead nation in this liberal international order defined by liberal democracy, free market economy, rule of law, multilateral cooperation, rights of the individual is what's under threat today. And that to me is what is so striking about the moment we're in. And to take my first point about the US, to me, I think about it as the United States no longer being a status quo power. We're not the status quo power that is trying to defend and extend this order. But it would seem that we are the lead nation that's gone rogue. And of course, it matters who's president of the United States, even if others in government might have a different view. And so I think this is uh, quite striking about where we are today. And as, as Nick pointed out, President Trump brings a deep sense of grievance to the relationship with Europe, this belief that our European allies have taken advantage of us over time on the issues that Nick mentioned, both defense spending and trade surpluses versus trade deficits. And Secretary of State Pompeo tried to articulate the thinking behind this and in one of his uh, speeches talked about how President Trump wants to rewrite the rules of world order in favor of the US while working to maintain stable relationships with geopolitical rivals. So this idea of disrupting the world order to force our allies to agree to reforms 
that are in the U.S. interests. And we've seen that the president actually is doing many of the things he said he would do. We have pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. We have put in place steel and aluminum tariffs, including on our closest allies, perhaps strikingly using a national security exemption. We have pulled out of the JCPOA, feeling that that deal to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon was uh, not in the U.S. interests. And, of course, we continue to beat the drum on defense spending, as Nick said. Um, and whether or not that issue is a legitimate one, I feel that the way we've gone about it has made it, in a way, more difficult to achieve that goal. And, you know, I think some of the comments that President Trump has made about the European Union are particularly striking, given that it was such an important goal of the United States to help create a European community and then a European Union. So to hear President Trump say that the European Union was set up to take advantage of the U.S. to attack our piggy bank. The European Union is possibly as bad as China, just smaller. It's terrible what they do to us. Look at the car situation. But again, you, you get this very clear sense of grievance. And it's striking to me when you step back and think about world order because, I th you know, as an American, when I look out at the world, I think the major strategic challenge to the U.S. in the 21st century is a rising China. And so the traditional approach to that has been to say, well, we would want to bandwagon and work together with our allies in Europe and our allies in Asia to try to extend our rules-based order and thereby encourage China to accede to it. It's a very different mentality that President Trump brings to this today. Now, I do want to say that I think President Trump is not the cause of any of this. He is a symptom of underlying trends that are alive and well in Europe. And so we have to grapple with why our systems of governance are seen by so many of our citizens as not delivering for them. There are as many people in Europe who feel they are losers of globalization as here. The sense of income inequality is certainly stronger in this country because income inequality is greater. But combine that with this sense that your cultural identity is being frittered away by migration, and you see a lot of commonalities between some of the voices here and some of the voices in Europe. But let me, that's what I want to say about the U.S., that we're no longer a status quo power and we've gone rogue in terms of our views of the international system that we built together with our allies after World War II. So what's happening in Europe? So Europe, of course, I will argue, is the status quo power. Europe wants to preserve the order. Europe in 2018 continues to believe that this liberal international order has delivered peace, has delivered prosperity, has delivered democracy in broad measure to much of the European continent. But we have to acknowledge that there are serious forces pulling Europe apart. And it is not clear today whether this weakened Atlantic link will lead to greater European solidarity or whether it will further deepen these intra-European splits. And you know, we know the list of things that are pulling Europe apart. The Eurozone crisis, which of course has reared its head again in the context of the fight over Italy's budget and how that will end. We see it in terms of Brexit, the second largest economy in the European Union deciding on balance it would rather not be a member of the EU. We see it in an assertive Russia on Europe's eastern border and the challenge that poses. We see it in terms of the refugee and migration crisis, which is continuing to have enormous ramifications across Europe. And we've seen just recently the implications for Angela Merkel. The internal security challenge of terrorism. Uh, and all of this has come into a toxic brew of seemingly ever increasing support for illiberal populism. And we see on the one hand Salvini's 
international alliance of populism against Heiko Maas's alliance of multilateralists. Where does this end? Where will this bring us? And I want to take those divisions versus unity and look at three of the geopolitical challenges that face Europe to see how this is playing out. And the first one I would look at is Russia. And in the case of Russia, we've seen tremendous EU unity in reaction to Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. We've also seen tremendous transatlantic unity in that case. And so my question with regard to Russia is will we see that unity last? We have seen Salvini talk at length about his desire to not have the EU continue to sanction Russia. At the end of the day, will Italy be willing to break that EU consensus? Or will Italy decide that they have some greater interests at play in a European Union context, and therefore they will continue to maintain that consensus? But I think Russia is a really interesting bellwether in this. Then the second geopolitical challenge that Europe clearly faces is China. And there my question is, can unity be created? We have actually a colleague of yours at Harvard and others have made the case that, you know, let's be honest, Europe is just not a strategic partner for the US. And we should declare success with NATO and let Europe take care of its own security and the US just needs to focus singularly on China. Um, I find that argument striking today because I think for the first time, Europeans have woken up to the strategic challenge that China poses to them. And so I'm interested to see if at EU level, you actually can forge a unified front against China. Why do I think Europe has woken up to the Chinese challenge? I think it's because China is going west. It's no longer about us going to China, but with Belt, the Belt and Road Initiative, China is going west. Among other things, buying up Europe's strategic assets. Look at the Port of Piraeus. It's now owned by China. And we've now seen Greece in EU councils prevent consensus from forming because of their interest with regard to China. You also, though, see increasingly European concern about those Chinese investments. So at national level and at EU level, you have a conversation about screening Chinese investment. And does Europe need to become more aware of the role China is playing in their economies and in their societies? At the same time, China is actively trying to divide the EU. And we see this through the 16 plus one format and other mechanisms the Chinese are pursuing. So I think China raises the question of, can European unity be achieved? And then the third geopolitical challenge, I am sad to say, is the United States, as we've already discussed, and, and Nick spoke to that very eloquently. Um, what strikes me about the challenge from the United States is I actually do not think Europe can unite in opposition to the United States. And I think we see this quite clearly in how Europe is responding to President Trump. And Nick mentioned strategic autonomy, which captures part of the European response to Trump, but only part of it. Of course, that vanguard is led by France, and I was in Paris just a couple of weeks ago, and the French were talking about strategic autonomy, and maybe autonomy is misunderstood, what they mean by that. But you know, they're basically saying, look, open your eyes, Europe. America's gone bad. We can't depend on this ally anymore, and we in Europe need to get much more serious about having our own ability to act independently. And then I go to Berlin, and in Berlin, I think there's much more a debate about this. There are some Germans who are squarely in the strategic autonomy camp, but there are many others who are arguing for strategic patience, saying this is a singularly U.S. president. We don't know if he'll be reelected. We imagine that if the U.S. looks at its interests, they'll see those interests continue to be served by a strong partnership with Europe. So really what we Europeans need to exercise is strategic 
patients. And let's figure out ways to keep the connective tissue there so if a U.S. administration comes to power that values us, we can restore. We won't go back to where we are. It'll be a different relationship, but strategic patience. And then you go to Warsaw and talk to Poles, and they're like, strategic autonomy versus strategic patience? Karen, what are you talking about? We Poles are all about strategic embrace because we've got this big country called Russia to our east, and we don't for a second believe the French and the Germans are helping us defend ourselves against Russia. For that, we need the United States. And that's why you saw President Duda come to Washington recently and reiterate the Poles are willing to pay $2 billion for a permanent basing of U.S. forces in Poland and to boot, we'll call it Fort Trump. So the European response to what we are doing is not a unified response. Which brings me to my third point, which is if Europeans are upset, concerned about what is happening in the US, what can Europeans do about it? How do you push back on this? What's the best way to deal with the Trump administration? And on this, I would say Europeans need to focus on where they have leverage. And I don't think where you have leverage is on sanctions against Iran. <laughs> I mean, it was very striking to see Federica Mogherini on the margins of the UN General Assembly after her meeting with the Iranian foreign minister stand in front of the cameras and say, we are going to put in place a special mechanism so that you know, Europe can not have to accede to secondary sanctions. And I don't think Europe has the ability to do that. We've already seen every major European company say, we are pulling out of Iran because we have a much greater interest in the US market. So I would focus on where you have leverage, which is trade. And there, the European Union is a powerhouse. And there are three things you can do on trade. One is defend the order. So yes, you should put retaliatory tariffs on the US for the tariffs we've put in place. And I think Harley-Davidson has taken notice. Um, secondly, you should extend the order. And extend the order by continuing to negotiate free trade agreements, whether it's with Canada or with Japan, and the list goes on. And thirdly, reform the order. We all would agree that the institutions we have probably are not fully fit for purpose in the 21st century. So start with the WTO and think about the challenge China poses and think about how you can work with the US to protect intellectual property, to not have forced technology transfer, be part of the bargain with China. So those were the three points I wanted to make. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Karen. And now we will have a European point of view from Daniela Schwarzer. Thank you very much, Mary, and thank you for having me here on this panel this morning. Now, the unfortunate news from a European perspective is that I agree both with Nick's analysis of you know, your grim picture of the state of transatlantic relations at this point, and I also agree with Karen's rather sober perspective on the way the EU is able to tackle its strategic challenges. But I still will share my thoughts, although I could also say, you know, I agree and I will leave. No, <laughs> I'd like to do three things. Um, one is I would like to give you my view on European perceptions and strategic debates as a reaction to Trump and what it tells us about the state of the EU. And I'll also comment on Germany. Um, and then I will briefly review the changes that we have seen over the past month um, or even years in the way the EU thinks about its own external relations, always with a particular question, what does it mean for transatlantic relations? And then I will briefly comment on the situation in the EU internally going forward because we are facing a key year, 2019, with European elections coming up. And I think many of the points that Karen made can also be related to this particular challenge. Now, first of all, so what happened when it became clear that Trump had a fair chance to become US president? 
First of all, Europeans broadly ignored that this could actually happen until the election night and the next morning. And I remember sitting on uh, TV panels and everything where people were still really digesting this is actually true. And I think that was very much the state of mind of, of Europeans that nothing of that kind can actually happen. And then secondly, that maybe what candidate Trump couldn't possibly said couldn't possibly be what President Trump will actually do. So the first six months of, its pre of his presidency um, were a phase where foreign, the foreign policy community in Berlin, but I would say broadly, more broadly in Europe, actually started to think in terms of worst case scenarios, what could actually happen, but those were not seen as very realistic. And the first six months, and I think Nick said that as well, uh, Trump didn't pick up some of the issues that became then so complicated for the Europeans. But I would say for the first, in the second half of 2017, a sense of, of realism hit Europeans. And it took a very long time, and there you can see how, how deep the perceptions of transatlantic relations actually are, and, and this, this sort of habit and the belief in those relations, that it took such a long time to actually realize what was happening. Now, there are, I would say, two, two broad challenges from the European perspective. One is obviously the change in some US policies and the clear exposure of what, you know, from a European perspective, we try to frame as European, or sorry, as strategic competition. But Nick quoted the term foe. And that is something that Europeans obviously now realize that, is, that that is the perspective from Washington. So that we are clearly opposed, or at least the Trump administration tells us we are, and that it is very hard to, to argue that we actually have joined and shared strategic interests. And the European way to think about it still is to think you know, beyond, obviously, the Trump administration and highlight where we have joined interests and where we believe no side can actually realize those interests in the medium and long term alone, but it's much better to cooperate. However, there is a sense of realism now that with Trump, there's this opposition and um, the perception of transatlantic relations as a zero-sum game. Um, it took, you know, I will just sort of give you an example how, how hard it was to, to manage this process of rethinking. In spring to 18, we set up a, a conference on strategic competition at DGAP. And obviously, we were looking at actors like China and Russia, and we had a long list. And then I said at some point, well, we should include the US, and there should, there should be a US panel. And we had people whom we invited to speak, uh, and, and also in the, sort of in the organization team, we had debates, can we actually do this? Can we put up the US as a strategic competitor in, in, in a big conference we are hosting? So that tells you where the minds still were as late as, as spring 2018. Now, um, today, there is no European joint narrative on what the US actually represents. And Karen spoke to that with a particular focus on France, Germany, and Poland. I think everything you said is, is absolutely true. And to some extent, also national foreign policy communities are divided. And Berlin is one of, of, of those where it's not really clear what our picture of the US is going forward. But one fundamental thing has happened, at least in Germany, we are actually thinking about a US strategy. So we need a strategy towards the US. And that is a pretty fundamental shift because we never used to have that. We just assumed this is a very close relationship. We are allies, we work, we may disagree on certain policy decisions. Um, and of course, Iraq is, is still sort of very present as a, as a deep divide, but this never led to the questioning of the relationship as, as such, not even the NSA affair, which was very emotional from the German side. At no point was there serious discussion then that we need a strategy towards the US. But this is the state of mind now. Now, what has the EU done? Um, there has been progress in the EU uh, internal discussions, in particular with regards to uh, the way the EU can assume more responsibility on the world stage, partly as a reaction to, of course, what comes out of DC, 
but not as a strategy against the US. And that is some, one of the, 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 the discussions within the EU where, for instance, the initial reaction from some Central and Eastern European countries, also the Baltic countries, was we shouldn't do too much because it may be interpreted as something against the US and we can't possibly afford that. I think it is absolutely true we cannot afford but to, to design policies which alienate the US further, that would be suicidal because we don't have the capacities in particular in the field of defense and in terms of economic uh, dependence, uh, we are clearly dependent on good uh, transatlantic relations. So, so we can't afford at the moment to turn away from the US, but I think the way to think about it is to to develop ideas how the EU can actually be a stronger partner in the transatlantic relationship, then to make its points in a clearer way in policy conflicts that may exist with DC, but not to set up in any way a vision uh, of, of independence uh, from the US at this point. Now, at the end of 2017, the EU moved towards uh, PESCO, which is the abbreviation for permanent structured cooperation in the field of defense, which is an important step, which in no way is a new invention of the year 2017, but which is going back to tedious efforts to actually improve defense cooperation over the past years. And now those efforts were clearly accelerated by uh, the election of Donald Trump, and in particular his statements on, on NATO and his expectation towards the Europeans. I agree with, with Nick that uh, in terms of uh, how much we spend on defense and how we spend on defense and how we cooperate on defense matters, uh, Europe has not uh, met up to the responsibility it should have uh, over the past years. And so right now we see developments in the EU which I think are positive with regards to the EU taking more responsibility, but at the same time, they are in a way tainted because I would say in every single member state you have an actor, a political party or a movement which says, no, we shouldn't be doing this because of Trump. The point is it's not because of Trump. It's been accelerated by Trump, but Europeans definitely need to do that. Um, the more recent debate we have, uh, and it's pushed by Berlin, is whether the EU can do more to be a more unitary actor on foreign policy. And so there are several ideas well out there. One is to introduce qualified majority voting um, on foreign policy decisions. Um, the other one is to push forward the, the idea of a, of a European uh, seat on the UN Security Council. There are several very sort of concrete ideas that are being pushed, but it's obviously very hard to get unanimity, which is what you need to, to introduce that and to move forward. Um, there is a sense, I would say, that we are facing a window of opportunity which is closing. So if we don't take those steps now, we may not be able to do that later. And there are two reasons for this. One is obviously the difficult political situation within the EU. Um, and I won't go into further detail now. I'm happy to comment uh, in the Q&A session, but for reasons of time, I mean, Karen has said a lot about uh, the problems of organizing uh, EU member states, uh, unanimity on certain de decisions. Part of that is related to the political constellations we have in member states. Um, where anti-European forces are present in parliaments, in some governments, or at least a vocal in the public. But then secondly, we have the issue of external interference in EU decision making. And if we are thinking about measures to make the EU a more strategic actor on the world scene, you will of course have Russian interests, Chinese interests, and I would argue also US interests, at least coming out of this administration, that have a very clear interest to prevent that the EU is actually able to provide itself with those means. So it's not a very positive outlook, and although you know, I live in a country and, and in a capital where there are serious reflections and efforts underway how we can strengthen the EU in this changing uh, global situation, um, it is hard to, to see how this can happen quickly and swiftly before the European elections in 2019. Um, 
The same is true for the internal reforms we need to uh, implement in order to be more resilient. That concerns, in particular, in my view, still, unfortunately, the Eurozone. Um, we are right now in a, in a situation where we have no manifest crisis, but it's easy to invent a scenario if you only look at developments in Italy. And I would say that the EU's capacity to actually manage a crisis, which may be similar to the one we faced in 2010, uh, triggered by the situation in Greece, or much worse, because it, Italy is a much larger economy. Uh, we don't have uh, a political situation in the, EU, in the EU member states' capitals, which is in any way comparable to the one in 2010. So it will be a much harder job to politically manage uh, any upcoming crisis and also to implement the necessary uh, governance reforms. Now, um, last comment on uh, the other major change that Donald Trump brings from a European perspective, the, the, the undermining of the structures of global order that we thought uh, were there to stay with some mild adjustments, maybe of some of the institutions, but that the US would remain an actor who has a clear self-interest in maintaining those institutions, uh, the rule of law and so on. Um, here, there is a varying appetite uh, between EU capitals. Germany is one of those who speaks up, uh, I think, most clearly to forge alliances, to do as what we can do to keep in place structures of global order, though there is an acknowledgement that they need to change. Uh, Karen has, managed, has mentioned the alliance of uh, multilateralists. That is one initiative which our foreign office is driving. Um, again, it's trying to frame this approach as not being against the US, but as being sort of something that, that at this point maybe works around the United States, uh, but which is of course and at every point open for a transatlantic conversation. This, however, is difficult to communicate. And if you are yourself tagged as a foe, how can you not be interpreted as working against that actor which has termed you a foe? So bottom line, um, from a European perspective, transatlantic relations at this point uh, remain crucially important. I made the points why, in security terms, defense, uh, economic and financial terms. Um, there's a strong degree of realism that we can't rely on what we used to rely on. There are ideas what to do uh, as an EU which wants to maintain much of what there was, but is open to reforms, but at the same time is very conscious of the limited resources it actually has in terms of uh, putting resources into the transatlantic relationship and putting resources into the mobilization of internal dynamics. So uh, not a very positive picture, but I can only say the strategic debate in Europe has hardly ever been as interesting as it is now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I will take the prerogative of the chair to ask the first question, but you can all start thinking about your questions. Uh, when you raise your hand, I will make a note and, so you don't have to keep your hand up for the entire time. And we'll hopefully get to as many of you as possible. Towards the end, we might start to bundle the questions. Uh, but let me start off with my first response to these remarks, and thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, it, in one way or another, you've all touched on what Europeans can do. Uh, Karen talked about focusing on where Europeans have leverage. Daniela, you talked about adjusting to the need to perhaps think of the United States as a strategic competitor. And both Nick and Karen, I, I was trying to write them all down, you've laid out four strategic stances which, it, viewed from the US from best to worst, go from strategic embrace to strategic patience, to strategic responsibility, and finally to strategic autonomy. So that's a broad menu for Europeans. My question is, what can Americans who care about the transatlantic relationship do? 
I was at a very insightful panel at the German Marshall Fund with Constanze Stelzenmüller, a knowledgeable commentator known to many of you. And, and she said, and this resonated very much with me, she said, you know, our generation thought that the transatlantic machinery was something that would always be in perfect working order. It had been built in a sound manner, and all our generation would have to do would be put in some oil once in a while. And it turns out that's not the case. It turns out the machinery is, is, is creaking and cranking and grinding down, and suddenly the transatlantic relationship needs our help. So what would you say Americans can do? I uh, get asked this question as well. I, I actually am going to be on this is probably my third panel on transatlantic relations in two weeks later this week, so I'm actually happy to just be the chair here and not the commentator. But when I do get asked this question, I say that I think U.S. European relations, transatlantic relations, I think there's enough uh, gas in the tank to survive for four years of Trump, but not four years in a day. I think that if the U.S. electorate re-elects this president, then we will see a far-reaching realignment. So the most important thing Americans can do to help the transatlantic relationship right now is to vote tomorrow and to vote again in 2020. So that is the answer I usually give, but I would be interested to hear from the three of you the answer to that question. And if people would like to start signaling me, I'll start keeping a list for questions. You want to start, Nick? Sure. Um, thank you very much. And, and to Karen and, and uh, Daniela, thank you for your great remarks. Um, I'd say this, Mary Elise, um, we need to, we Americans need to argue against the demonization of Europe and Canada. And it's an extraordinary thing. If you think of the political symbolism of embracing Kim Jong-un and we're in love, we're in love, <laughs> not my words, the president's, to the silence uh, in the White House about what Putin is doing in Ukraine and in pressuring the Baltic countries and Poland. You take that imagery and you replace it and, and you compare it to the demonization of Angela Merkel and Justin Trudeau. Those are the two people he's chosen. And it's all about leadership and it's making the case on Twitter, on Facebook, in the United States Congress in our public debate in this election and the next election that Europe is three things. Our leading trade partner is the European Union. And by the way, Donald Trump, Europe's economy is bigger than China's economy, the economy of the European Union. So you're wrong on the facts. Number two, the leading investor into our economy is the European Union countries. And number three, the leading number of American treaty allies in the world are the 27 European countries in NATO. Those are facts. And so we have, to, we have to join the debate. The president has demonized refugees and demonized immigrants and demonized his political opponents. I mean, take a minute if you're European. Just Google one of these mass rallies. There was another one. There's one tonight in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, his final one. I'm, I'm not objective here. I'm subjective. I worked on the Hillary campaign. But just look at what he's saying the gross distortion of facts. So we have to engage and win in the public debate. And second, I would say, uh, Mary Elise, we have to help Europe, particularly in the migrant issue. And I think we have to have a conversation, all three of us have talked about it, whether it's strategic autonomy, which I hope it's not, or strategic responsibility, which I hope it is, <laughs> or strategic embrace, that would be even better. <laughs> Um, we have to define this together. We're not separated yet. We're not divorced. And so we have to work on these issues together. Uh, and frankly, I think that Mattis is willing to do that. Mattis is a former NATO commander. He deeply, he believes deeply in the alliance. I think Pompeo is, but Trump is not. So you have to work below the president's level and almost see that we have two U.S. governments, in a way, on, on Europe. So I, I think... Nick gave a great answer in thinking about sort of how the government can, can engage on this. And I would add to that that I think for all of us, it's important to not only look at the U.S. through the prism of the government. And, you know, I was so struck, Nick, when you opened by saying there's no tenured faculty member at the Kennedy School who teaches Europe. Mm -hmm. And it's just an example of how we have taken the transatlantic relationship for granted. And we've done that 
in universities, we've yeah. done it broadly speaking. And so one of the things that we think a lot about at GMF is how do we get outside of, in our case, the Beltway, um, beyond Washington, D.C., and engage with Congress, which would be inside the Beltway, uh, governors, mayors. We have over 3,000 alumni of our fellowship program that are strewn across the U.S. So how do you have a conversation um, that doesn't just engage the executive branch about the transatlantic relationship? And you noted something really important, Nick, in your remarks, which is NATO and Russia are the two issues where there's a strong bipartisan consensus in the U.S. Congress. So it doesn't matter what party it is, there is still a deep understanding of why it's in the U.S. interest to have a strong transatlantic relationship. So governors also understand that European investment in their states creates jobs. So I think it's also about engaging at these different levels and appreciating that we can't take the relationship for granted anywhere anymore. Okay, so I'll add from the European perspective. So my first point is really give Europeans reasons to believe in the sense of strategic patience. And how can that be done? Um, I think, yes, it's, it's important to, to multiply contacts and to have Americans over in Europe uh, to precisely do what, what Nick said, uh, is showcase that there is a very different vision of U.S. responsibility in the world of transatlantic relations, et cetera, et cetera, out there with a credible narrative that those actors and people can actually get back into decisive decision, uh, positions. Because um, right now, the sense in Europe really is when you travel to D.C., you can easily <coughs> talk to the like-minded, but they don't matter anymore. And you don't get access to those who, who sit in the administration and to, uh, who actually determine U.S. policy. So there is, I think there is a very, very deep discussion going on in Europe, whether this idea of strategic patience actually has any value or whether the shifts in the U.S. are so fundamental um, that we really have to adjust to a new situation. And I would say we Europeans, there are still many who are ready to invest into the relationship with that sense of hope. But as much as possible should be done from the U.S. side to, to keep Europeans uh, in that belief that it's worthwhile and that we can bridge this very difficult time at the moment. Um, so one of the key points is that there are people in the U.S. administration who, who command huge respect and trust in the EU. One is Mattis, he has been mentioned. And, uh, you know, whenever he comes to one of the big meetings like the Munich Security Conference or so on, people are relieved and say, okay, great. Um, but then there's a NATO summit and Trump comes and then we have a problem again. So one of the conclusions is avoid NATO summits, just work on the ministerial level, just to avoid any p point of potential further escalation that may destroy more uh, than we, we believe from today's perspective. Second point, yes, multi multiply the actors that are in the game. I think one thing that is perceived from the EU uh, side with a lot of interest is the reaction in the US to leaving the climate deal, climate agreement, uh, the way mayors have stood up, the way corporate representative CEOs have stood up and said, we will still respect those goals. And that is a very practical point uh, where Europeans can relate and where cooperation is effectively possible and in a, in a very good way. And the third point goes to uh, sort of the, the piece of intellectual exchange and, and joint thinking, teaching about transatlantic relations, researching. What I observe is that there is a pretty strong readiness of at least German foundations, German corporates, uh, to invest in transatlantic relations in, in, in terms of chairs or research programs in DC, but we don't at all see the same happening the other way around. So I think it's much easier uh, to, to fund a position uh, on transatlantic relations or on Europe in the US at the moment than it is to fund a position on transatlantic relations in Germany or any other European capital uh, or on what's happening in the US. And Europeans invest, but this is not the same the other way around, very strikingly so. So those are three points. I think that might help. Nick wanted to add. I just recall a quote. Mary Elise is an historian. I just recalled a, a quote from 80 years ago. I think the answer to your question is leadership. 
we have to have more Republicans, senators, and governors standing up to support this relationship, as well as Democrats. And 80 years ago, when we were inward looking, when the Congress did not want to vote Lend-Lease Aid to, for Britain, um, Roosevelt said, Franklin Roosevelt, when your neighbor's house is on fire, you lend him a garden hose. And there were two messages. One, it's the right thing to do. Your neighbor's house is on fire. Two, it's self-interest. Your neighbor's house is on fire. <laughs> the fire could spread to your house. Europe's house is not on fire, but Europe is facing big challenges that are very much in our interest to help resolve. It's leadership. Trump has demonized Europe. I would think that any possible future Republican successor or Democratic successor would see Europe in very different terms. And it's about leadership and convincing Americans that Europe's not our enemy. It's actually our ally. Great. Well, there's already six people waiting to ask questions. So if I could ask the questioners to identify themselves and to be brief. And I've also been informed, breaking news, that there are now ceiling mics that will be controlled magically. So we don't actually need handheld mics. Uh, you may will speak and be heard. So if you could please introduce yourself when you start, Stefan. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and first, yes. uh, Stefan Cornelius, I can stand up, or, or probably that's easier for the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I have a question which is uh, directed to all of you, and I really think this, this on the second round was tremendously focused on practical things to do. There's a German tendency, especially German tendency, to get into theory, and theory means something mostly in strategy. So we talk about various months of strategy, what we can do, but rather uh, we should talk more about what practical things are, and like Nick's um, um, emphasis on Afghanistan, for example, I think there could be a huge European stake in, in, in solving the riddle on how to get out of it. Uh, my question is, get more of those practical things, ideas out, trade, defense, whatever. The second one, especially to both of you, how do you uh, rate sort of the, 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 the possibility, the, 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 the impact sort of the second tier administration does have on, on, on keeping ties uh, intact, um, the working around theory, if you, if you want. Um, um, there is a huge demand, and I just want to remember uh, to that little incident in summer, um, shortly before the NATO summit, uh, there was a big uh, rumor going around that well, Trump might actually announce withdrawing American troops from Germany, which was a huge thing. And uh, then we had that weird summit, ridiculous summit, and about two weeks later, um, Defense Minister Madison announced to send another 1,500 troops to Germany to be based on opponent's uh, uh, basis. So this is the practical answer to all the theorizing. Uh, now, can we do more of it, and where? And uh, yeah, this is um, just one little anecdote since I'm talking. <laughs> I, I happen to be in, no, it, it, it really helps to get the picture. I, I happen to be in, in, in Belarus last week. A week and with the group, and we met Lukashenko. And Lukashenko, he's uh, now has the honorary title of the last dictator of Europe, carries that proudly. Um, was actually, um, first of all, advising us to follow democratic rules and not vote Angela Merkel out of office. This would be <laughs> undemocratic. But the second thing is, it was he was really honestly belittling, uh, belittling Donald Trump, uh, uh, sort of making him a laughing. Uh, subject. Uh, he's uh, referred to him as Donald and he shouldn't be taken serious. And then he was voicing honest concern of Europe breaking apart. So if you hear that from a, a Belarus voice and uh, from Lukashenko's voice, um, I think and this is probably the last question. Um, how do you enhance awareness of the problem, mostly in Europe? I think this is where it's probably Daniela's uh, patch. Um, um, get Sort of not got only the, 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 the big players, Paris and, and London, whatever, ever engaged, but also the smaller ones who are not really aware of the dangers. Do you want to start then? I'll go last. You'll go last. All right. Karen, Daniela. I mean, on the, on the practical things, I agree with you. We need to think about those. And that's why I tried to end on, on the trade piece, because I do think that's a place where. Europe does bring a lot to the table. And I do think China is an area that we should explore working more closely together. Um, you know, we all presumably read Vice President Pence's speech. And uh, I mean, I worry about 
on the one hand, sort of a cold war with China and where that leads. On the other hand, I think it's right that we, the U.S., we collectively in the transatlantic community need to push back against ways that China has really taken advantage of the open system that we've created. And I do, I'm hopeful that there might be some things Americans and Europeans can do together. And I mean, the, the specific ones are around protecting intellectual property and pushing back on forced technology transfer. I think there's something to be said there. I think the climate issue is another area that's really important. I mean, Daniela referenced it. Just to go a little bit deeper on that, it is striking to see California under Governor Brown, and this will continue, basically stand up. So it's not only mayors. I mean, mayors are super important, and Bloomberg has been very supportive of the coalition of mayors, but you also have a coalition of states. And given that California is the fifth largest economy in the world, it actually matters if California and other U.S. states are saying we will live up to the commitments made under Paris. And I think there are opportunities for European governments mm -hmm. to work at that subnational level here on issues like climate where there's tremendous resonance at the state level. Um, you know, we also have seen the German government this year kick off the Germany year in the US, and that'll be an interesting case study to see what happens when you try to do events across the country to heighten awareness of what this relationship means. But, you know, I think those are all areas where we're trying practical things. I mean, the role of folks around Trump in moderating him, I, I think the lessons of the past year and a half are mixed. So there are on issues that President Trump is dug in on, no one can influence him. And so that's one thing. But there are lots of issues he's not interested in where those around him can have enormous in fact, impact and, in fact, drive policy. And you noted some of them. Um, I, you know, what I worry about is what happens tomorrow. And, you know, I hope. We do see a, a blue wave in the House. Um, if we don't, I mean, if the Republicans hold majority in both houses, you will see a Donald Trump unleashed. And I would worry about the tenure of Jim Mattis. I would worry about Jeff Sessions and Rod Rosenstein and Bob Mueller, because he's going to feel empowered to do. So I actually think sort of the, the role of those around him is going to be impacted in a very important way by what happens tomorrow. Yeah. Did I mention it's important that everyone vote? Did I mention that? Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned that, right? Okay, just, just checking. Uh, Daniela? <laughs> yeah, so, so I think from what you said, Stefan, it became very clear that Trump doesn't only have a transactionary policy style, but also an ad hoc policy style. What you said about NATO and, you know, the rumors around the summit and then what actually happened. And that makes it very hard for Europeans to come up with ideas, what we can constructively do together. So I think it's all about preparing many things at the same time. And I felt that the, the, one of the strategic... Uh, uh, let's say, um, failures of the EU in 2017 was not to pick up at Trump's major foreign policy concern at that point, which obviously is no longer that high on the agenda, but he kept speaking about terrorism, fighting terrorism. And Europeans never teamed up to actually say, hey, this is how we think about it. Why don't we think about it together and that way? And there you can see that Europeans are not reactive enough. I don't expect the EU to be in a position to do that very quickly, but at least a group of countries can be more anticipatory and more reactive to present ideas that can actually lead to, to potential joint action. But as we have this ad hoc approach, it's very difficult to anticipate. Now, for your point on, on Europe actually breaking apart and the awareness and is it shared, um, it's, I think there is a broad sense that a lot is at risk. And the case of Italy, in my view, has made it very clear that we are not only talking about political risk scenarios of something happening that at some point you actually see more countries wanting to withdraw. I don't think that's going to happen. But rather that we may be facing another crisis, a market-driven crisis triggered by political developments in some or several EU member states. And I think that's the more forceful driver of disintegration than what we see going on politically. The political developments we, we are witnessing at, those mom at this moment, they prevent progress, at least for the EU 27. 
they lead to a situation where we were not able to use the window of opportunity that three factors basically opened, the French elections, the German elections, and Brexit. That would have made all that together 2017 the ideal year to push forward to solve some of the problems we have. This has not happened, and I don't believe it will happen at the December summit, at least not in a very substantive way. Um, so we see that the politics on the ground prevent progress. I don't see a big political clash coming, but a potential further erosion of support, ability to solve problems, even problems to actually legislate once we have the new political constellations in Brussels with the EP elections, uh, changing the composition of the parliament, maybe completely changing the political dynamics of the parliament, even though I don't expect a Eurosceptic majority in the parliament, a new composition of the commission. Commissioners are sent by their respective governments, so they will represent what has happened in member states. Um, so there, there will probably be, after uh, the change of political leadership in Europe in 2019, a system which is slower and maybe in parts dysfunctional, and that will lead to smaller groupings of willing states to start solving problems their way, which may mean around the EU system if it doesn't contribute to problem solving anymore. Uh, again, not a good perspective, but I would argue that at this point it is better to have smaller groups of countries pushing certain, certain things if they remain open for others to join later than to lock ourselves into a situation where the system doesn't manage to tackle the huge challenges we are facing. Great. Uh, in the interest, oh, sorry, did you want to again? I just wanted to say, I thought, Stefan, you were right to say that in the next okay. two years, we could have a practical working agenda that might make progress below Trump. And that would be on Afghanistan. We went in together. We have to find a way to come out together, not separately. And so Europe has to be very much involved in Holly's eyes negotiations. Number two, the administration is changing on trade. They're focusing on China. So they've made up with Canada, Mexico, Japan, South Korea, and now they want to make up with you. And Juncker had a good meeting, kind of a truce, how to turn the truce into a working relationship again on trade. And then how to go after the Chinese. Interesting article in the New York Times this morning, they're stealing their way, stealing, uh, E-A-L-I-N-G, not the other <laughs> kind, towards uh, in the race for technology domination. Uh, the U.S. is dramatically tightening through CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment, Chinese ability to buy American companies. They see Euro Europe as an easier mark. Can Europe and America tighten up and Canada together? There's the Balkans project. There's the Contain Putin project. There's a lot we can do together at the Mattis Pompeo um, Mnuchin level, our Secretary of the Treasury below Trump. Great. The uh, list of questions is growing and the time is shrinking, so I think I might start <laughs> taking two uh, at questions. So if we could have uh, Julian Holworth and Stephen Erlanger uh, ask their questions and then we'll go to the panel. Okay, Julian Howarth, uh, currently at Kennedy School, trying to persuade American students that you're interesting to study. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to be reassuring on semantics, because Nick, you say... Autonomy means separation. No, it doesn't mean separation. It means non-dependency. And NATO is never intended to be a structured alliance where there is a hegemon and a dominant and a dependent and a child. It has to be a much more balanced alliance. And strategic autonomy is actually a proposal to create more balance within the alliance where the Europeans can actually become competent and responsible uh, for the neighborhood. That's, that's what it's about. It's not about separation. It's not about decoupling. It's about creating a healthier, stronger, and more balanced alliance. At which point, if Europeans actually do become capable of managing the neighborhood, we can sign a new treaty, a more balanced treaty. But it is not about decoupling. I think that that is the misunderstanding on this side of the water, which many people on the other side of the water are a little bit confused about, but that's the agenda. Eisenhower said when he took over the command of Sacco in 1951, that if NATO is still needed in 10 years' time, it will have failed in its mission. 
The mission was to empower Europe. And I think that if the Americans can get it in their head that the, the task is to help the Europeans become competent, that should be the strategic objective. Hi. Um, a quick comment and a quick question, given time. A quick comment is, for all the humping about NATO, it is <coughs> worth pointing out that we put in more money, more troops than ever before, and, and, and the Congress is like 98 to 0 in the Senate about NATO. So I'm a little less worried about NATO. Even John Bolton conspired against <laughs> Trump to prevent him from screwing up the communique. So there is that, we're saying. The question, which is really, um, given the sanctions were snapped back this morning, yeah. Um, and I've tried to write about this today, but the EU E3 plus Mogherini keeps saying, oh, this is a great issue for us, a great issue of our national security. Right? Um, and of course, this is the one issue, much more than trade, that puts them absolutely in opposition to the United States in terms of national security interests as self-defined. And it puts them in bed with China, with Russia, with Iran, with Bashar al-Assad, with lots of ugly people. Um, so the question is, is it really a matter of European national security interests to uh, prop up the Iranian government? Um, or is this somehow um, putting Europe in a place that is not only indefensible, to some degree, and the fact that it can't defend it. That's what I mean by indefensible, not morally indefensible. And um, worsens ties with the United States in ways that are probably unnecessary. That's the question. I, I, I'm not judging it. I'm just asking. Yeah, I, can, I, can, I can start with that one. Um, I think there, are, there is a very clear conflict of interest between three policy goals here from the EU perspective. One is to maintain the Iran policy, which Europeans, I think, at least uh, the countries that participated in the negotiation of the JCPOA, uh, they, they do believe this is the right approach to handle the problem with Iran. Now, the second policy goal, once Trump said he would leave the deal, was to demonstrate EU capacity to act on a key foreign policy issue. And if you like, I mean, Mogherini, but also for the, th for the countries involved, the E3, um, this was the major and one foreign policy achievement in the past years for the EU. So yeah, there was something to protect here. And the third one is indeed that broader political context which you have just outlined, um, and that is whom are we in bed with um, if we do what we have announced, and that is to create an alternative approach to funding activities in Iran and protecting our companies and so on. And I think this, this debate isn't solved or this conflict of interest isn't solved. And you see, whichever angle you look at it from, you see different constellations of actors who argue this is actually the more important point here. And what I see happening over time also because it is so hard to actually see how Europeans can put into place a special purpose vehicle that actually works and bring companies into a position where they say, yes, we will go on investing or trading or selling or whatever. Um, I think that the, 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 in the triangle, the attitudes are shifting towards a more critical perspective of the immediate reaction to, to Trump withdrawing from the JCPOA. And I think over time, um, I think Europeans will try to do more to engage with the US over the actual question, how do we deal with Iran? I think that's the most important thing to do at this moment. Yeah, you know, I think the Iran case is interesting for so many different reasons. I mean, A, it showed that it really didn't matter how a European leader engaged with President Trump, they wouldn't have an impact. I mean, we saw Macron come for a state visit and the key issue was the Iran deal along with the, the steel and aluminum tariffs. And he couldn't move Trump. And we saw Merkel follow in his wake later that week with no pomp and circumstance making a similar case. And 
you know, he just wasn't going to be moved. And this, I think, was particularly galling to the Europeans because they spent the better part of the first half of this year negotiating in what they thought was good faith with the U.S. on side agreements that would deal with issues that were not addressed in the JCPOA, Iran's role in the region, Iran developing a ballistic missile capability. And so I do think there is something very personal about this as well, that the Europeans feel like, hey, you know, this is the EU came out on the JCPOA as a foreign policy actor with you, and you're just stonewalling us. And I think this is particularly true for Federica Mogherini. So there's something v deeply personal about this mm -hmm. that has now mixed in with <laughs> all of the factors uh, that, that Daniela rightly articulated. And, you know, I think, as we know, emotion is best set aside when making foreign policy. And that's why, to your point, in a sense, they're in a position now which they can't get out of because they they want to stand strong against us, but they really don't have any means to do that because the dollar is the reserve currency in the world and U.S. banks play an outsized role in the global financial system, and that's not going to change. There's no SPV they can come up with that will be credible for European companies. So I think the challenge now for the EU is how does it – on the one hand, stay true to its principles, so it's going to stay in the deal, which is what it's doing, um, but not be seen as cozying up with Russia and China in defense of a country that's doing really bad stuff. And we just had Denmark come out saying, hey, you know, the Iranians just assassinated. And France in October. And France in October. So, I mean, the, the EU, I do think the ball is in the EU court to say, how do you square that circle? On the one hand, continuing to believe that the JCPOA is a way of keeping Iran from developing this nuclear capacity, yet taking seriously the other very real threats Iran poses and nefarious activities Iran engages in. So I think that, that's the challenge for the EU. Uh, Jolien, I think that in both of our political parties, um, we want to see Europe strengthen militarily. If PESCO means an increase in capability without duplicating NATO, you'll see an American support for it, without, without question, for sure. The problem is, um, as we would, we would agree, words matter. And to American government ears, autonomy means on our own. Separation. It makes Trump's argument. You see, they're bilateral, too. Trump's all about, you know, we'll just make our own decisions. Let the Europeans make their decisions. We'll separate. It makes his argument. Just a word change. I mean, it, whether it's embrace or responsibility, keep the policy intact. That, it, the word does not work. It doesn't work for Congress. It doesn't work out in the campaign trail. It helps Trump. How about non-defense? No, because it's so, we, we are together. We are together. That, that's what NATO is. We are not separate from each other. We unfortunately have five more questions in five okay. minutes. So. <laughs> but I, gotta, I have to say, say to Steve Erlanger, um, I would, if I were the Europeans, I'd focus on the secondary sanctions. They're grossly unjust. We negotiated between 05 and 15, 10 years, the EU and the United States negotiated together against Iran, Bush and Obama. And now we've just pulled the rug out from under you. Not just leaving the agreement, we're going to hurt you. It's grossly unjust. The Europeans of the upper hand focus on that. Don't become the defender of Iran's odious regime. And there's a, there's a problem, I think, in the European tone especially, and I, I have deep respect for Ms., uh, Ms. Mogherini, but don't become a cheerleader for Iran. They don't deserve that, and you don't want to be in their camp. I would separate the two issues. So I would suggest I want to give people who raise their hand a chance to ask questions. If you could pre please make your questions as brief as possible. We'll just take all five right now, and then we'll let the panelists choose you know, each, yes. each one they want to answer. So, sir, in the back, if you could stand up, identify yourself, ask your question. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Jed Schwartz. I'm a writer. Uh, uh, it's, it's a question comment. Uh, when, uh, when Trump uh, visited Mr. Uh, Putin in, uh, earlier in the year. Helsinki. Helsinki, yeah, in Helsinki, that's right. I, I don't remember where it was. Helsinki. So uh, Putin made a comment that was widely ignored, namely, we are interested in responding to Western efforts to help us wean ourselves from 
our economic dependence on the export of carbon fuels, natural gas and oil. This, nobody he made this comment, and, and it's just over the. I'm, I'm sorry, but if you would answer your question. Okay, so my question know. is: uh, Is not the case that we should that, that that's sort of a wedge issue that would uh, sep that if Democrats, uh, uh, Democratic leaders, uh, said yes, we sh we should help Russia wean itself from its dependence on oil, the, the World Bank, the IMF, American Treasury should, should, should embrace the issue of how to wean the world and Russia. Off that. Yeah, okay. uh, that's a suggestion, uh, because I know there's very okay. influential people here. I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to move on. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. And you had a question as well. Uh, yes. Um, um, I would like to ask about the uh, biggest challenges that you named, uh, geopolitical challenges, China and Russia. Um, so first, do Europe and U.S. agree on those challenges? And second, Russia and China tactics are uh, dealing to de in, in dealing with the world are different. Uh, Russia is more aggressive and China is more, I would say, cunning. Uh, so, how do you see the partners should deal with those threats? Thanks. And uh, right here, if you could just make your question yes. brief, please. Uh, my name is Eleni Varvitsiotti. I'm an EU correspondent for a Greek newspaper called Kathmerini. And my question is, um, it's very simple. I want you to take a step, step back. I mean, I was wondering, when, uh, um, when uh, President Trump looks at the global map, do you think the transatlantic relations are really high up in his uh, foreign policy agenda? And uh, if you can give us your take on which are the most important policy, um, foreign policy agenda points. And then the woman, uh, no, next, next to you, you right there, yeah. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'm a graduate student at the Fletcher School, and my question is Professor Burns. Following up on something you said earlier, um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on what role Canada can play in strengthening the transatlantic relationship and how Canada and the EU can help each other in dealing with the U.S. And then the final question is the yeah, yeah, my name is Yulia Hamadi, and I'm a postgraduate student at the LSE in EU politics. And I was wondering how the future relationship between NATO and a strong European defense cooperation could actually work. So you all mentioned the importance of PESCO, um, but take into account that the US was highly skeptical about reinforced European defense cooperation um, due to a possible undermined NATO or possible weakened NATO in consequence. So, uh, I was wondering how um, they both could, could actually reinforce each other in a mutual way instead of weakening. So I apologize to the question asker is obviously we don't have time to address all these issues. But if I could ask our panelists to pick the one question or two that spoke to you and use that, that to make your final remarks, I'd be grateful. Nikki, okay. uh, Karen, one. okay. And then, um, so the question about Russia and China. Um, because in my mind, they pose fundamentally different challenges to the U.S. and Europe. And when I think about Russia, I do think that Russia is fundamentally a declining power. And that sets a whole different set of challenges for both the U.S. and Europe. It can be equally dangerous, but part of it is because of the structure of the Russian economy and, and it's the fact that it hasn't modernized its economy. Um, there are lots of reasons why I would make the case it's a declining power. But I think that's fundamentally different than China, which is clearly a rising power and is bringing um, tremendous economic, uh, political, military resources to the table. And I think one thing, you know, that said, I think we in the US and Europe should be thoughtful about the extent to which we Americans are pushing the Chinese and Russians to cooperate more than they have in the past. So I think there's actually a new dynamic between those two countries that we haven't seen in the past that we should collectively be paying a lot more attention to. And that's all I'll say. Kevin Rudd, the former Australian Prime Minister, gave a speech recently when he said, we've moved from 40 years of strategic engagement with China to outright strategic competition. And I think few people would argue about that. Jake Sullivan was here last week um, at my request, and he spoke on the record and said he felt that the Democratic Party was completely aligned with President uh, Trump, and, well, Vice President Pence's speech, and that we're now in adversarial mode. Uh, I, we need to have a better balance, A, but B, 
the growth area for the U.S., Europe, and Canada is to be together on China and to spend some time with each other focusing on China. How do we balance partnership and competition? I think we've, we've swung wildly towards confrontation. It's very, very unhealthy. And um, what can we do on your, your last question um, on EU defense spending? There is great anticipation that Europe will do more. But Jens Stoltenberg, I think, speaks for the U.S. at least and NATO when he says, as long as it doesn't undermine NATO. I, and, and that's a, this, is, this is definitely a mission that the Europeans can succeed in, as long as it doesn't undermine NATO, because NATO has to continue as the lifeline, as the, the bridge across the Atlantic from Canada and the United States to Europe. Pardon? Danielle, you get the final word. Thank you so much. Yes, I'll pick up this last point Nick made. Sometimes I think, you know, that, that uh, thinking that PESCO could undermine NATO is, is really overestimating what the Europeans can actually do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's flattering at the same time. No, but on a very... <laughs> On a very operational level, I, I, you know, I'm aware that there are real efforts being made that NATO representatives sit in the committees and the other way around, that, for instance, uh, the uh, European Defense Agency, whenever it works on PESCO projects, has a NATO person there. And so this institutional linkage or the institutional linkages have been built, and very consciously so, because obviously there are very vocal EU governments that precisely want to um, prevent that anyone thinks that PESCO undermines NATO. The Poles are really key players here. I would say Berlin is also to be included. So I think this has been taken care of. And you shouldn't underestimate the extent to which uh, some of the defense ministries, including the German one, are really socialized in NATO thinking. I mean, this is they, they have a NATO reflex, and PESCO is an additional thing. But... From sort of the very operational perspective, it is always the NATO prism and NATO framework that that works uh, most strongly. Um, but Canada, very brief comment. Yes, it has risen on the, let's say, on the on the uh, in the ranking of, of important partners from an EU perspective. Uh, I think the contacts have intensified recently between Canada and key EU players to really offer an alternative transatlantic relationship. Um, uh, but we we shouldn't you know believe that Canada can in any way replace what we are deploring is missing on on the uh, U.S. side. But it's an additional partner, and it's also included, of course, in the uh, alliance of, of multilateralists that that Berlin is trying to build. So um, there are intense uh, intense contacts. Final remark on on Russia and China. Um, I, I have to be very short here, but but I don't think that the U.S. view and the European view is fully the same, fully aligned. I uh, would even wouldn't even say that Europeans are always uh, of the same opinion what the two actors represent, and we have briefly, you know, discussed this with Chinese influence within the EU impacting government positions on policies relevant to China. So there are things going on here within EU policy making that China actually tries to steer and determine. Um, however, I would I would say that Russia, from an EU perspective. We are worried about Russia, Russia attacking, you know, institutions, EU member states, uh, our neighbors. So, so that is obviously a clear uh, worry. But we are more worried about Russian instability than I believe the U.S. is because of the proximity and the repercussions an unstable Russia would have for us uh, as EU countries. Um, for China, I believe that... China doesn't want to undermine the stability of the EU. It doesn't want the EU to fall apart because it needs a functioning single market. It needs, needs the financial stability of the euro to further develop its own big strategy of, of basically global dominance. But it is in a systemic competition with the EU over very fundamental norms um, and, and other issues. And, and I think that's where the EU and the US could align. Um, the one thing that Europeans want to prevent at this point is to be uh, forced to choose between 